Hello, and thank you for joining us. I'm Gwen Taylor, Senior Developmental Editor with Current Protocols at John Wiley & Sons, and I'm delighted to introduce today's webinar titled Extracellular Vesicle Enrichment and Characterization from Cell Culture Supernatants and Biological Fluids. This webinar is being co-sponsored by Current Protocols and EMD Millipore. EMD Millipore is the Life Sciences Division of Merck KGAA of Germany and helps customers prepare and analyze samples in academic, pharmaceutical, and applied research environments. The company is excited to apply its membrane expertise to the fine separation required for preparing extracellular vesicles. Current Protocols has been in continuous publication for 28 years and is the largest collection of peer-reviewed, authoritative, and regularly updated step-by-step -step research techniques and procedures available for life scientists worldwide. With 17 titles and over 16,000 protocols, Current Protocols is part of Wiley Publishers. During today's program, we encourage you to submit your questions throughout the event by clicking on the Ask a Question box at the bottom of your screen. Your question will not be seen by any of the other attendees. The webinar will be recorded and available for viewing in the next few days. We will send you an email with details of how to access the recorded webinar along with a PDF of the slides and a certificate of attendance. So now it's my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. Dr. Alec Clayton leads the Exosome Biology Group at Cardiff University, specializing in the functional aspects of cancer cell-derived exosomes and their roles in disease progression. Dr. Clayton received his BSc in biochemistry from Cardiff University and went on to study kidney fibrosis for his PhD. After postdoctoral training at the Institute of Nephrology in Cardiff, he joined the Cancer Immunology Group at the School of Medicine in Cardiff, where he established his interest in exosomes as immune modulating agents. Dr. Clayton has since demonstrated diverse mechanisms by which exosomes interact with both innate and adaptive immune components while also exploring the molecular composition of exosomes using proteomics methods including LCMS and protein array technologies. Recently, his group has focused on cancer-associated fibroblasts and with international partners through a Movember-funded consortium, has been developing approaches to study exosomes in biological fluids. Dr. Amadeo Capion has had over 20 years of experience in molecular and cell biology, specializing in the development of cell and protein-based assays. After obtaining his PhD from the University of Rochester, Dr. Capion continued his postdoctoral research at the University of Rochester Medical Center, focusing on lupus and understanding key checkpoints in human B-cell tolerance. As a member of EMD Millipore's applications group, Dr. Capion's current focus is on improving the workflow for the enrichment, characterization, and analysis of extracellular vesicles. So let's go ahead and get started with a very warm welcome to you, Dr. Clayton. Thank you, Gwen, for uh, inviting me to come and participate in this uh, interesting webinar. So when we talk about vesicles produced by cells, there are essentially two main types of vesicles that we're talking about here. There are larger plasma membrane-derived vesicles, which we would call microvesicles, and there are also generally smaller types of vesicles. These are principally manufactured within the endocytic compartment of the cell and are released into the extracellular space. Now, we would call these exosomes, and it's exosomes principally that my group has been focusing on on the past few years. Collectively, we have this umbrella term, which we call um, extracellular vesicles, and that's a term that the Inter International Society for Extracellular Vesicles has now coined as a coverall term for vesicles in general. Um, these are just two um, electron microscopy pictures showing the presence of vesicles in endocytic compartments fusing with the plasma membrane showing the release of exosome-like vesicles into the space between cells. And on the left, I'm showing you this from cells which have been cultured. And on the right, we see identical structures present in tissue sections. So these things are present both in culture and, of course, in vivo. And they are a real phenomenon. They're not merely an artifact of cell culture, which was once believed to be true. Um, on slide three, this cartoon depicts my interest in exosomes in cancer, and we know that these vesicles play roles 
highly complex roles in basically everything that cancer cells do in order to exist and to grow and to spread. So they modulate immune cells, they can alter the architecture of the microenvironment surrounding tumor cells through engaging um, fibroblastic-like cells and also, also triggering antigenic um, responses. They can also migrate to distant sites through the lymphatic system, impacting lymph nodes, for example, and also distant organs such as lung and bone. And when you think about therapeutics for tumors, we know that vesicles play a role here too. So cytotoxic drugs can enter cells, can be encapsulated in membrane and thrown out in the form of vesicle. Um, and also vesicles can act as decoys for more targeted therapies such as antibodies. So everything that a cancer cell needs to do to exist, a vesicle, exosomes or microvesicles will have a role to play in this. So I think cancer is very developed in this sense, but also other diseases such as cardiovascular disease and neurodegenerative diseases all have major roles for vesicles involved in the pathology of um, biogenesis of the disease process. So when we start thinking about analyzing vesicles, what are our sources of vesicles? Well, we have cells and we have tissues in traditional cell culture plates as depicted here on the left. Um, but the challenge is there is that the cells are essentially at quite low density. So when you're dealing with um, these types of traditional culture systems, you're handling an awful lot of volume, and that becomes quite hard work. I don't have a, a great solution for you here, but certainly in my lab, we've had a lot of success um, using these uh, miniature bioreactor type of flasks, these cell line culture systems here, where the cell density can be much higher um, this gives you a huge advantage of simply handling less volume. And of course, exosomes and other vesicles are known to be present in an assortment of biological fluids. And essentially, if you look at any biological fluid, you will find some vesicles present. Predominantly, um, the fluids we're interested in are blood and urine. They're probably most relevant in terms of discovering biomarkers for disease, for example. If you look at this cartoon, it shows you a vesicle structure replete with a whole bunch of components, both inside, protected, inside the lumen of the vesicle, and also on the outer membrane of the, of the vesicle too. So what are the characteristics of this structure that we might be able to take advantage of in order to isolate these things out from more complex fluids such as blood or urine? Well, firstly, these things are genuine vesicles. So they're much bigger than a small peptide growth factor, for example. So maybe we could use something like centrifugation to spin these things down in a preferential manner. Or maybe use the density properties of these vesicles to separate them from other components. Also, of course, there are membrane proteins and other membrane-associated factors associated with these vesicles. And maybe we could use an affinity type of method to grab these things and separate them out from other components of fluids. Also, these things are small. They're really tiny, of course, compared to whole cells, but they're pretty enormous compared to soluble molecules, for example. So maybe we can separate them on the basis of size. And lastly, maybe we can interfere with the solution in some way and mess about with the solubility of these things and hope they drop out of solution. So I'm going to cover these four points in the remainder of my talk. But before I do that, we do need some tools to be able to analyze what we have at the end of the day once we purify these things. And we have had some really great advances in the field in the last 10 years or so with the advent of machines such as the nanoparticle tracking instruments, such as the NanoSite platform, for example, and also um, ISON do a, a slightly different system, but again, allows you to measure the number of nanoparticles and also give you an idea of the size distribution of the nanoparticles in your preparation. And these are really useful devices. There are flow cytometry instruments now, which allow you just about to get down to the nanometer, 100 nanometer size range, which might allow you to do some very interesting subpopulation analysis studies of vesicles. Generally, though, these are fairly limiting still, and I know there are a lot of technical developments going on to try and tease further further down the resolution down to the 50 nanometer scale, but that remains quite challenging. Nevertheless, these instruments, I think, are coming online now and are very useful tools.
And of course, we have our uh, rather routine um, systems and methods for looking at vesicles by electron microscopy, for example. These are still very useful tools. An advancement in the last few years for EM has involved the use of cryo electron microscopy, which gives you better structural information without the compromises of fixation and dehydration, which may impact the structure of the vesicle somewhat. And we're making a lot of use these days of microplate-based assays, and of course the routine use of Western blotting has still has its uses in these workflows. So let's think about these vesicles in terms of their sedimentation characteristics, and maybe we can use centrifugation to spin them out of solution, for example. So this is a very, very simple standard workflow that many exosome researchers will use, and it was first um, described in detail by Grasser Raposo and her colleagues, published in a very important and elegant paper, Journal of Experimental Medicine, 1996. So here she took some B lymphocytes culture, and she spun the cells down at a fairly low speed, took the supernatants from that cell pellet, and increasingly spun that at faster speeds again and again and again, and at around 70,000 G, she found a second pellet which contained MIT class II molecules, suggesting a membrane type of composition here. So just by serial centrifugation, um, it's quite possible and very easy to get a membrane prep from supernatants. So this is a classical differential ultracentrifugation type of process, and many labs use this. It's a pre-clearing step for any workflow. We certainly do. But Grass and her colleagues weren't satisfied with that, so they took that 70,000 G pellet and they overlaid it on a continuous gradient of sucrose, and they span those tubes really hard. And somewhere along the sucrose, MAC class II was found to float at a range of densities. And when she looked by electron microscopy at those fractions, they contained these tiny classical exosome-like vesicles staining very heavily here for MAC class II. So this is uh, the principle of isolating vesicles based on their flotation characteristics. And this is an example of how we do it in my labs. We set up a gradient of sugar, and you can see in this red circle here, a cloudy colloid of concentrated vesicle preps goes on top of the gradient. And then we spin these very hard overnight, and this, uh, this cloud moves down the tube and will stop when it finds its equilibrium point along the gradient here. So we can take serial fractions from these tubes and measure the refractive index, and this gives you an idea of the density of the sugar at that point. And then you can do different things with these fractions. So in this graph, top graph on the left, graph A, um, we use nanoparticle tracking, and we analyze each gradient in series here. Um, and this revealed a peak of nanoparticles at the density that we might expect for exosomes, which is typically between 1.1 and 1.2 grams per mil. Um, we took those gradients, we coupled them onto sticky latex beads, and then we stained those beads for antibodies. And then through those antibody bead exosome complexes down flow cytometry instruments. And again, we saw a peak staining for CD9, CD81, and 63, these classical tetraspanin proteins, which are abundant in exosomes, floating in the right density, exactly as we saw for the nanoparticles. Or you could do Western blots for these fractions, concentrate them down by palleting or by solvent precipitation, and see where the proteins of interest float. And again, in this proteomics paper published some time ago, we saw proteins like electin and bacigen floating principally at the classical exosome densities here. Sugar is not the only matrix available for doing gradients. Um, a lot of groups have used OptiPrep recently, and this probably gives you better resolving power. Um, one group, for example, showed very nicely the capacity for OptiPrep but not sucrose to resolve HIV virions from exosomes secreted by HIV-infected cells, for example. Um, OptiPrep also offers the advantage that it's isotonic all the way down the gradient, and it forms spontaneous gradients if you set it up as steps, so 40%, 30%, 20 and 10. Um, so it's much easier to do these OptiPrep things compared to the sucrose. So I would certainly consider OptiPrep for future. We've done a little bit with, with blood with OptiPrep, but not a great deal with cell line work. This slide here shows you the typical workflow for my lab, and I'm bringing in together multiple elements here just to, demonst just to demonstrate and give you an example of 
how difficult it can be to get good quality um, high yield exosome preps set up in your lab. So firstly we start off with um, these bioreactor flasks, we're already concentrating the exosome vesicles in the supernatants before we even start. So this gives us an 8 to 10 fold concentration of vesicles. Then we do some pre-clearing steps. And then instead of doing a gradient, we do a shortcut here where we float the vesicles on a cushion of sugar, which is designed to capture vesicles of this density. And then we simply wash that pellet with PBS and we have our exosome prep. Although this is a little bit more work than simply a pellet and wash protocol, it gives you more of the good stuff in terms of CD9, CAT1, LAMP1, and all the things you'd expect to see for exosomes. And you get slightly less of the things that you wouldn't expect to see. In urine, for example, TAM horse cell protein is a notorious contaminant of PREPs. But if you do a flotation step, you simply get less of this contaminant in your final product, which is well worth doing. When I first started working exosomes, I didn't actually have an ultracentrifuge at hand, so I had to think a little bit creatively here. So we were working on B cells at the time, and I knew from Reposer's work that B cells made exosomes which had very high levels of MHC molecules on their outer surface. So why not use that property to maybe capture them using an antibody? So that's exactly what I did. So dynal beads at the time did. Um, Im immunomagnetic beads coated with class 2 capturing antibodies, so we put some beads into, into supernatants. Um, we rolled these tubes out for a while, overnight is probably better than a few hours. And then we used a magnet to pull the beads down, and if you do some analysis by electromicroscopy, you can see hundreds of little vesicle structures stuck to the surface of the bead, exactly as we would expect. So if you use vast excess beads, you get really good depletion of vesicles from your supernatants, or if you use a limited amount of bead, you get really good saturation of the bead. And if you use the latter, then these bead exosome complexes are really amenable then to an analyzing them by flow cytometry in a way, similar way I showed you earlier. There are products available now that you can buy off the shelf. I know Invitrogen, for example, do a CD63 bead, which is quite useful. Although note here they call it um, isolation detection reagent from cell culture media. So I, I think they've had trouble, and we certainly have had trouble using beads to isolate exosomes from plasma or other biological fluids, for example. This capture, this affinity strategy just doesn't seem to be particularly efficient. GSL Micro also do beads, CD9, 81, and 63. Um, and again, I claim that they may work fairly well with biological fluids, but it's something I haven't tried, so I'm unable to comment on how effective they are at that. Instead of beads, it's very much more convenient perhaps to use plates, microplates. So we developed a very simple classical sandwich lyser, which is described in the Weber Oncogene paper, where we've captured based on CD9 and we've detected vesicles based on class 1. So in order to get a signal here, of course, both proteins must be present in a complex, and that would be suggestive of a vesicle like an exosome. These types of ELISA are now available commercially. So Hansa Biomed do a series of products which work in this way, and also there's um, a fairly new product available from Gels Cell Guidance System, sorry, which aren't so much ELISA-based, but they are similar in that they use a time-resolved fluorescence-based readout However, with our ELISA and, of course, these commercial ELISAs, what we really need is a good standard curve, something that's been independently certified as a really good quality exosome preparation. And at the moment, there's a little bit of an elephant in the room in that we don't have anything of the kind. Um, so to be able to accurately quantify exosomes based on an ELISA-based approach is still challenging, simply because we don't have an, a suitable standard in the field. I'm sure that will come in the next few years. The next property of vesicles, um, which I'd like to discuss, is their size. And the simplest way of separating something by size is by filtration. So if you imagine a very complex sample where you have exosomes plus also bigger things, fragments from cells, for example, you could use a filter such as a 0.45 or a 0.22 cutoff filter to eliminate the larger debris. The small things on the exosomes should fall through. And then you could use a finer filter to maybe try and grab exosomes on the surface of that filter. Again, that would remove the small soluble components. 
and hopefully protect and grab exosomes on the, on the membrane. And there are different types of filters that you could use, perhaps singly or in serial, to try and do this. I know many researchers have had some success using amicon centrifugation-based systems, certainly in urine and in other fluids. I personally haven't tried those, um, not for some time. But I'm aware that filtration, although it's quick, fairly simple and fairly cheap, will bring with it some problems. So very quickly, if you have a very complex sample, you're going to form a gel layer on the filter and basically clog the filter up very quickly. Some samples, like cerebrospinal fluid, is really not amenable to filtration. It's particularly viscous stuff, and we find it clogs filters up in pretty much immediately. And if you're pushing very hard to try and get your sample through the filter pore, you're going to expose your vesicles to some extraordinary shearing forces, and we know that vesicles can be damaged if you're pushing them hard through filters. And if you're trying to grab exosomes on the surface of the filter, it brings you extra problems in trying to recover all those exosomes in an efficient manner from the filter. The exosomes are particularly sticky, they stick to plastics, they're bound to stick to filter membranes. So your, your recovery there is going to be questionable. There's other types of filters available. This is a depiction of um, diafiltration, I think some people call this, or tangential flow filtration, where we have a hollow fiber as the filter. The pore size will be chosen to trap exosomes. Solutes will come out as the permeate, and you will recycle your exosomes. They go round and round and round into this hollow fiber. Um, there are two forms of this available. We've tried the microcost system recently from um, Spectra Labs, I think they are. And this is basically a very small hollow fiber. You have your syringes here, and the sample goes back and forth and back and forth, and the retentate builds up in this waste filter here and then you can collect your samples. It's a really good system, very convenient for concentrating samples down. As long as the sample isn't too complex, again, like any filter system, it's possible to clog these pores up, and that limits the use of these devices. You could have a proper grown-up version of this, which involve a pump and some pressure gauges at each end, and again, the fluid will cycle around and around. So these systems are really great for concentrating and purging volume, they will also concentrate vesicles to an extent, but also protein. Um, so we don't, in our hands anyway, get a huge improvement in terms of purity, but they are very useful for concentrating high-volume samples down, such as urine, for example. And also, the um, new kid on the block, really, is size exclusion chromatography. There's been an awful lot of interest in these devices recently. There are two commercially available ones now that I know of. Um, Eyes on do one, which is based on Cephro CL2B. Cell guidance systems do one based on a proprietary resin, but essentially I think they work fairly similarly. Um, this example, these green plots, is um, an example I did with cell culture supernatants using the cell guidance system version, showing nanoparticles come up here and they dissipate as the proteins come up. And in the middle peak here, we're seeing a range of stainings for CD9, 81, 63. So these are fractions coupled to sticky microplates, and we're staining with antibodies. It's a very simple assay. But you can see here the separation of exosome markers from the bulk protein in the sample. And this measurement here is um, comparing nanoparticle to protein as a ratio. So this is a very quick and easy way of assessing the purity of a sample by taking a particle to protein ratio measurement. And it's in these high ratios where we begin to reveal out our TSG-101, this classical marker of exosomes by Western blotting. So as well as the commercially available columns, you're perfectly welcome to make your own. And this is an example of work my postdoc, Joanne Welton, has been doing recently. Well, we've been trying to extract um, exosomes from blood plasma. This is a really challenging thing to try and do. So we've established cephalous columns, but they're very long. They're about 30 centimeters long. And by doing this, we get a pretty good separation of the protein compared to the particle to protein ratio here. And it's these fractions, which are the fractions that contain these wonderful nanometer sized vesicular structures. So this was an example of cryo electron microscopy. And often by cryo EM, and you don't really see this by traditional TEM, by cryo, you do see often membranes within membranes within membranes. There's a little Death Star type of structure here, which is my favorite. Um, again, this gives you really good structural information that you 
perhaps would not know about using traditional approaches and the column methods is a really good one-step approach for cleaning this huge burden of protein which is present in plasma and facilitates further downstream analysis by mass spec or some other omics analysis. So another trick that people are using increasingly now is to interfere with the solubility of the system. So for example, if you had exosomes in water, you added in a whole bunch of salt molecules in there. The salts are now taking up the water. The vesicles don't have enough water to keep them in solution, so they begin to complex. And then a low speed spin will bring these exosomes down into a pellet. This is very cheap, very easy thing to do. Um, however, the selectivity of any precipitation approach is to be questioned. Um, you're bringing down vesicles, certainly, but you're also certainly bringing down a whole bunch of non-vesicular material there. And also in your final product, you have your precipitant present. So a lot of salt in your, in your sample is going to be really bad, for example, if you want to do some 2D gels. So you need to think about removing the precipitants as a vital step for further downstream analysis. There are more and more products available these days to help you do precipitation. Probably the most famous of these is the ExoQuick product. Um, many groups fairly new to the vesicle field will go to ExoQuick as the first solution to their problem of how do I get exosomes. And it may well be as part of a workflow, ExoQuick may be very useful. But I do tend to warn people to be careful with any precipitation-based approach, that you're pulling down vesicles, but also a whole bunch of other things that you don't really know what, what else is coming down. Extra quick are guilty of this, but all the other precipitation methods are equally guilty of this. In vitro didn't do a, a product based on polyethylene glycol, I think. Um, cell guidance systems do a PEG-like substance for precipitation, but they also have a column second step to help eliminate the precipitants, which of course is very useful. And there's a very, um, very quirky kind of product available from New England peptide, which is based on small peptides that bind to heat shock proteins exposed on the outer surface of vesicles. So these peptides will cause vesicle complexation fairly quickly. And again, a low speed spin will help you pull down the vesicles without sort of centrifugation. Um, at least with this approach, it seems semi-selective at least for vesicles which are heat shock protein positive. Um, and you get a gel there which is fairly enriched in vesicles. Um, all these precipitation approaches have their advantages and also their disadvantages. So as part of a workflow, they may well be useful, but I would urge people to use them with a degree of caution and skepticism. Now, recently, the Journal of Extracellular Vesicles, which is, of course, the sister journal for the International Society for Extracellular Vesicles, has published um, an editorial paper entitled Minimal Requirements for Definition of Extracellular Vesicles and Their Functions. This position paper is not, to my understanding, meant to be um, an authoritarian or didactic list of things that you must do. Rather, it's supposed to guide researchers in good practice when they're working with vesicles. And in this report, they made three major points, which I'll try and handhold you through. Firstly, when you have an exosome preparation, you need to look at the protein repertoire in your sample. Classically, in my lab and in many of the labs, we would look for some tetraspanning proteins present, such as CD9, CD6381, perhaps some markers related to the endocytic tract, such as TSG101 or Alex, for example. And that's where many groups would stop. However, um, I sever advising people not to do that, but also look for things that they should not expect to see in their sample. Um, the Golgi mitochondria, the nucleus, these are compartments of the cell which are not particularly well represented in exosome vesicles. So if you stain for some markers of Golgi or mitochondria, you should probably not see abundant bands on your westerns for these components. However, my caveat here is that we don't fully understand the protein repertoire of vesicles yet. So here, MMP is named as something that shouldn't be there. But my take on this is we don't actually know whether that's true, especially because cells are so dynamic. The way proteins are moved around, different cellular compartments can also be dynamic. And it can also go catastrophically wrong in cells like cancer, for example, or trafficking may be perturbed. So these are general guidelines. They're not meant to be absolute rules. I think we should be sensible in how we approach these. Second recommendation by the society is to look at single vesicles. 
classically, of course, we do this by electron microscopy. And if you look in the literature, you will see many examples where single vesicles are shown in boxes like this. You see one single vesicle structure, which is fine, but what we really need to see is a wider view. Let's look at all the population of vesicles you have in your PrEP. You may have some structures like this, which don't look particularly vesicular. Maybe, maybe this is a protein complex or a bit of debris from cell, for example. So you need to show the water and all TEM of your vesicle PrEP. And also, in addition to microscopy, for example, one of these other new techniques, nanocytes or the ion, or something similar to look at the vesicle population as a whole. Ideally, you want a description of the vesicle size distribution and an idea within your population of how, men, how much of the uh, material is actually not likely to be small vesicles. There are some examples here of particles which are 400, 500 or more in size, but these are relatively rare events in this example. The predominant material is small, around 100 nanometers or so. So that would be fairly typical and fairly reasonable as an exosome preparation. Lastly, and this is, um, this is a really important point that many researchers slip up on, you have a function ascribed to your vesicle, you will get the question, how do you know that that is truly a vesicle-driven function and not a function related to some contaminant in your vesicle preparation, something soluble that also co-pellets with your vesicles? So this is a very difficult question to address. In the past, um, I'm giving you an example here from a Jamie Knoll paper. Well, we were measuring the enzyme activity. Um, it was CD39 eating up ATP. So we did some sucrose gradients. We saw that the densities that were not exosomal, there was no enzyme activity. However, we saw a nice enzyme activity classically where we'd expect to see exosomes floating. This coincided with the enzyme on Western blots in these fractions, and also the exosome marker TSG also coincided here. So collectively, this little graph gives pretty good evidence that ATP hydrolytic activity is related to the exosomes and not some contaminant. Another way of doing this may be to use an affinity approach, perhaps pulling exosomes down based on CD63 beads, for example, and measuring the enzyme activity now related to the beads. And also to include some controls would be good. So maybe if you had an exosome that was CD39 negative, that would be a really great control to use. So the society is basically highlighting some of the pitfalls and traps that researchers typically fall into. And I think reviewers' manuscripts are going to get tougher and tougher on these types of questions. And the society is trying to give you some advice and guidance on how to approach some of these problems. Clearly, one tool, one, one size hat does not fit all. It's a matter of bringing together all these different elements in order to qualify. You have good quality vesicle preparations and that the function that you have to those is genuine and not due to contaminants. So I'll finish there, and I'd just like to thank my um, closest colleagues, Jason Weber um, in particular, and Joanne Welton, who's been working very hard on the biofluid stuff recently in the lab, and of course, Professor Malcolm, who is the head of the team here. The electron microscopy was done in collaboration with Juan Perez and David Gill in CSE Biogun in Balboa in northern Spain, and I just thank them warmly for their collaboration in the imaging of vesicles. Thank you for your attention. I would like to um, introduce Amadeo Capio now, who's going to talk to you about some of the Milipo products in relation to extracellular vesicle preparation. So, Amadeo, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Dr. Clayton. Hi, my name is Amadeo Capion. I'm an application scientist with EMD Millipore. Today, I will focus on the use of Amicon Ultra centrifugal filters for extracellular vesicle or EV enrichment but I will also touch on the use of other platforms for sample qualification. I've broken out the EV sample prep workflow into four basic categories, pre-clearing, enrich, isolate, or purify, detect and quantify, and analyze. Most commonly, cells in apoptotic bodies are removed by low-speed centrifugation. There are a number of methods for the enrichment and or isolation of EVs. Ultra, under size-based fractionation, fractionation, there's ultracentrifugation, which is really the go-to method, but there's also sucrose gradient fractionation, 
as well as size exclusion chromatography. There are also a number of commercially available precipitation reagents. Lastly, our bead-based options, which potentially offer the greatest specificity through use of targeted antibodies. Once you have your EV sample isolated, you're going to want to know how many and how pure the PrEP is. Currently, the NanoSite from Malvern offers the straightforward determination of particle size distribution as well as concentration. And as well, electron microscopy is available for confirmation of morphology. Similar to cell analysis, there is interest in knowing what's inside the EV as well as what's on its surface. Of particular interest recently is miRNA content, given the relationship between the presence of particular miRNAs and relationship to certain diseases. Lastly, purified EV preps are now being labeled and used to study mechanisms of uptake with the potential goal of EVs being used as therapeutic vehicle. Focusing on the enrichment step, there are a number of issues or pain points associated with each of the current methodologies. Ultracentrifugation requires costly equipment and there are issues with pellet resuspension and overall recovery. Sucrose gradient fractionation, although it is known for offering the highest sample prep homogeneity, it is plagued by a long and tedious process as well as significant sample loss. Size exclusion requires fraction collection and analysis. And the precipitation methods suffer from pellet resuspension issues as well as incompatibility with certain downstream applications. One potential alternative for EV enrichment could be membrane-based filtration. EMD Millipore's Amicon Ultra family of centrifugal filtration devices are designed specifically for the concentration and buffer exchange of biological samples. All members share a number of key attributes which make them well suited for this application. These include a very low binding ultracell membrane, no requirement for special centrifuge, no pellets to resuspend, and the ability to accommodate a wide range of sample volumes ranging from less than one mil up to 15 mils. Initially, we look to focus on processing EVs and serum-free samples or those with low protein content such as urine. The proposed method was broken up into two phases Clarification, using a vacuum-driven steri-flip filter, the 0.22 micron membrane is useful for the removal of large cell fragments or apoptotic bodies. The filtrate is then loaded into an Amicon Ultra and two spins are performed to concentrate and buffer exchange the sample. To investigate the feasibility of this application, we have worked with MDA MB231 cells, a human breast cancer cell line. For all this work, Cells were grown to roughly 75% confluence in conditioned media, washed thoroughly, and shifted to serum-free media for 48 hours when cell culture supernatant was harvested. The plot on the bottom right shows a viability measurement taken on the MDA culture at the time of media recovery. Using the guava flow cytometry platform and Viacount assay, cultures were routinely found to be greater than 95% viable at the time of harvest. To optimize the assay, we wish to assess a number of key parameters, the most critical being identification of the proper molecular weight cutoff membrane format to employ. We also needed a quick and simple method to quantify our recovery and thus be able to monitor optimization. Since we did not have access to a nanocyte or electron microscope, I developed a bead-based flow assay. Seen here is an enriched EV sample containing a number of different types of EV. The EVs were fluorescently labeled using a Bodipi dye. Looking specifically at one type of EV, the exosome, these particles all express CD63 on their surface. Using a magnetic stripped avidin bead labeled with antibodies specific to CD63, we can capture the CD63 positive EV fraction from any sample. Since the same culture parameters are being used throughout the method development, 
This one subtype can be used as an internal standard to assess overall EV recovery. Once captured, bead EV complexes are run on the guava flow cytometer. For this assay to be quantitative and thus be able to tell me how the optimization is, I needed to establish a curve. To do this, I perform bead capture on a titration of a known EV sample. The histogram overlays show the results of just such a titration. Samples with higher concentrations of labeled EVs had beads with higher MFI signals. The mean fluorescent intensity values from the titration were used to establish a curve, where MFI signal is proportional to the number of CD63 positives EVs captured. Interpolation from the curve allowed me to determine the relative concentration in a given test prep. Getting back to optimization, the Emicon Ultras are available in five molecular weight cutoffs, 100, 50, 30, 10, and 3 kD. Equal volumes were enriched using each of the five formats. Resulting fractions were labeled with Bodipi and assayed as just described. On the left is a histogram overlay for the five molecular weight cutoffs, and to the right are the relative values presented graphically. To our surprise, a significant amount of EV were lost when the 100K device was used. In fact, as the filtrates were labeled, we found a significant fraction of CD63 positive EVs present there. Our bead capture results paralleled measurements of protein content taken on lysates. Protein quantitation was determined using the direct detect IR base spectrometer. Two microlayers of sample was spot on the assay card sample concentration determined in under one minute. Overall, our findings from optimization are shown here. For molecular weight cutoff, the 10 kD format was chosen over 3 kD as it offered faster processing. EV processing was equivalent and compatible with all four device sizes. For spin speed, 4000 G was found to be optimal. At slower speeds, we had issues with loss of particles due to sticking to the membrane. To the right are representative images from electron microscopy and a nanosite nanoparticle tracking analysis showing the distinct structure and peak homogeneity respectively. To confirm the feasibility of this method, we validated the Amicon Ultra process against the gold standard for EV prep, namely ultra centrifugation. In step one, an EV fraction was enriched using the Amicon Ultra method and labeled. Labeled EV were then spiked into a second supernatant that were then purified by either ultra centrifugation, precipitation, or ultra filtration using the Amicon Ultra. Final samples were assayed by bead capture flow cytometry and western blotting using the SNAP ID detection system. Here we are using a two color bead assay. The spiked EVs can be distinguished from the native EV on the basis of the Bodipi staining. The total EV can also be measured with a fluorescently tagged antibody to another common marker such as CD9. Looking at the plots at the top, we found greater than 90% recovery of labeled EV for both the ultra centrifuge and ultra filtration methods. The precipitation method was far less efficient which may be a function of labeling or stability of the precipitated EVs. Using the SNAP ID for rapid immunoprobing of western blots via vacuum filtration, we found roughly equivalent levels for three known exosomal markers, an XNA2, HSP70, and ALIX. So we have a method that works well on low protein samples. However, most cell culture conditions and biological fluids have high protein content, specifically albumin. Since albumin is present in such a significantly higher concentration, it can interfere with accurate detection of rare species. To give you a quick example, these two graphs were derived using a direct detect spectrometer. We're looking at processing of an EV sample using the Amicon Ultra where FBS was or was not present. The arrow denotes the protein amide 1 peak, which is used to determine protein concentration. As you can see on the right, Albumin content completely dominates the signal. The big question is, can we remove the albumin 
via ultrafiltration. Well, one initial thought was to potentially use the 100K molecular weight cutoff to trap large albumin aggregates. If you remember from the earlier slide, the EVs were able to pass through this size. The 100K filtrate could then be concentrated using a 10K device as previously described. To look at this, we took media from serum-starved MDA and added FBS to it just prior to processing. Samples are processed according to the standard 10K method and the new two-step 100K, then 10K format. Resulting samples were assayed by bead capture. The top histogram shows similar EV recovery for serum-starved samples by the standard method as FBS containing media on the new two-step method. If we look for EV in the 100K retentate, we see very few present. The bottom gel demonstrates a significant reduction in albumin in the filtrate resulting from the 100K fractionation. While preliminary, these results are quite promising and suggest a possible method for processing EV from high-protein samples. In summary, I presented two Amicon Ultra-based enrichment methods for use with low or high protein samples. However, it should be noted that these methods thus far were developed and validated on a limited number of sample types, may thus not have universal application. Thank you for listening. All right, thank you, Dr. Capion. So let's go ahead to the question and answer segment so if you haven't yet submitted a question, now is the perfect time to do so by clicking on the Ask a Question box at the bottom of your screen. So let's go ahead and see what questions have come in so far. Uh, first question is, I'm preparing vesicles from serum-free medium. Should I, be concerned, <laughs> should I be concerned that the cells are becoming unhealthy and secreting apoptotic bodies that might confound the analysis? Uh, Dr. Clayton, maybe you want to start with that? Well, certainly it's, it's a very valid concern. Uh, it will all, of course, depend on the, the cell types that you're working with and how sensitive they are to this kind of serum starvation. Certainly when you deplete serum from cells, you're, you're altering a whole manner of factors which we don't really know and understand properly. And we know that the lipids in the cell can change and the whole manner of proteins can change in the cell. So the exosomes that they're producing will also change. And if you also have some cell death there, uh, it's very possible that you have contamination of your vesicle prep with apoptotic material, other forms of cellular debris. And again, depending on how you prepare your vesicles, that may be a huge contamination or a less impactful contamination. So... Certainly with respect to serum starvation, it is an issue. You need to think hard about it and validate your system before you launch in, I think. All right. Dr. Capion, did you have any further comment on that? Do you maybe need to unmute your phone, Dr. Capion? Sorry about that. All um, right. <laughs> No, I think, um, I think Dr. Clayton covered it very well. Um, there's a lot of issues, um, you know, that are associated with, uh, with working with serum, with basically switching over what would be a standard cell culture method into a serum-free method, most obvious being the perturbations of the, of the cell itself due to this change. Um, and then, uh, you know, our, when I was developing uh, our method, um, I focused on making sure that my cells were greater than 90% viable at the time of harvest um, to try and diminish the amount of cell debris due to apoptosis that would potentially interfere with what I was doing. Okay, um, going forward, it's not always clear um, which of the two presenters um, are the most appropriate ones to answer it, so why don't you just go ahead and jump in and um, if both of you have an answer, that's fine. Um, so next question is, how can we extract the contents from EVs? Can I, can I launch in on this one? Sure. sure. This, is a, this, is a particularly, um, this is a particular question we're quite familiar with. When we started doing proteomics of vesicles a few years ago, we found that the mass spec facility was really struggling to give us any protein identifications at all. 
And we were tracking back through the workflow, and we found out that the, soluble, the solubilization of the vesicle preps that we had was extremely poor. So even if you take an exosome prep and you boil it for 10 minutes in SDS buffer and then run that down a gel, the vast majority of that sample will sit at the top of your stacking gel. It won't enter really the gel. It's incredibly how, how robust these vesicles seem to be. And the trick we found was to add some denaturing agents such as DTT in the system, and then we get proper um, fully fledged solubilization of the vesicles. Um, so depending on what you want to do in terms of extracting the content, um, you, I think you'll need a, a fairly robust protocol to ensure that you're fully solubilizing the entire proteome um, within the complex of the vesicle. Um, that, that's the best advice I have for you there, really. All right. Um, on to the next question, then. Um, this one is actually directed to Dr. Clayton. It says, how large of a problem is HDL, which has a density similar to exosomes, as being a contaminant of the preparations, and what's the best method to remove HDL from an exosome prep? Yeah, this is a really great and very difficult question to answer. Um, I think there's been a lot of discussion about this in relation to the use of column size exclusion methods with blood. Um, there's a group in the Netherlands who have used a Cephalos column, a very simple column similar to those I showed you, and have shown a separation of um, lipoproteins from the exosome peak, um, and that was based on measuring cholesterol. Um, but we know that there's cholesterol in the exosome vesicles too, and the exosome vesicles may have markers that you'd normally associate with lipoproteins, such as APOE, for example. So it's very difficult to to actually discriminate what is a lipoprotein and what is a, an exosome vesicle. We've used a column-based approach, and following the column cleanup, we do um, ultracentrifugation to concentrate um, the exosomes down. And certainly the uh, lipoprotein con composition there is not pelleted with such efficiency as the exosomes at the speeds we're using. So a pellet combined with a column method gives you a reasonable cleanup. I'm perfectly aware that there's bound to be a degree of LDL, HDL, and other lipoproteins contaminating these um, exosome preps of ours. Um, but our method is basically a compromise approach, which is relatively simple and tractable, and lets us handle um, tens of clinical samples through the workflow. Um, I don't know whether other people have got better methods for eliminating lipoproteins from the system. I'd be really keen to hear if they had little tricks in order to help us do this more efficiently. All right. Um, next question uh, could be for either of you, I suppose. Uh, what is the best way to assess vesicle purity? <laughs> hmm. I thought um, you'd like that one. <laughs> well, I, I would say that... Um, uh, I think Dr. Clayton started to address this near the end of his uh, the portion of his talk, where uh, there was a recent um, paper that came out, I think at the end of last year, um, from um, the International Society of Extracellular Vesicles, where they sort of outlined some of the necessary steps which would um, both um, identify a good prep and also identify a good degree of purity of your sample. And it required looking at multiple things, um, not only uh, checking the size, um, the homogeneity of the size via um, a nanocyte-type instrument, electron microscopy also to look at the morphology, but then assessing a number of different proteins, both, present, both that should be present within your vesicle, but also looking for the absence of proteins that should not be there. Um, as, as just a good starting point for, for understanding how pure your prep is. Uh, Dr. Clayton, maybe you can add some additional thoughts? Yeah, sure. The, we've had these problems, um, you know, daily in the lab and the kind of work that we're doing. Um, so we really scratched our heads about this. What we wanted is a really quick and easy single method to give us some kind of estimation of purity. So with the advent of the nanoparticle tracking technology from Nanosite, um, we do a, a particle measurement and then we also measure protein by a colorimetric assay. And then we relate the two numbers together, so we get a particle-to-protein ratio. So if the, if the sample preparation is replete with non-vesicular contaminating protein, then that ratio measurement is very low 
If, however, you've got hardly any soluble protein there, you've only got your vesicular protein, the ratio is simply much higher. Um, so we described this in a paper in JEV, um, I think it was early 2013, and it's a very, very simple, um, quick and easy approach to do this. Rather than having to look at um, the structure of the vesicles and then perhaps do a series of Western blotting, looking intentionally for potential contaminants in the system, it's a very uh, quick and very convenient way of doing this. Um, an alternative method uh, proposed by a group in Budapest have um, suggested something similar. So just look at the particle to lipid ratio. And again, that would, that would work in a similar manner. Um, these quick and easy tricks do have caveats, however, because lipid content and protein content of a given vesicle may change in different situations. Um, for example, in cancer, there's some evidence to suggest that the protein load per vesicle is much higher, in which case our particle to protein ratio measurement will be affected by that and will be will give an artificially low number. Um, so just use it sensibly as well as as long as you're aware of the pitfalls of it. As a routine day-to-day -day lab tool, we find the particle to protein measurement is very, very useful way of tracking the quality of preparations routinely. All right. Well, we've got some really great questions coming up here. Uh, the next one is, can I isolate exosomes from frozen tissue samples? Wow. Um, I would imagine that is going to be quite a challenge for you. Um, we've, we've had some attempts at handling tissue homogenates in the past. We've had some biopsy from prostatectomy. Um, we've mashed those up and collagen is digested and taken the, the liquid fraction, if you like, off those digested tissues and tried to spin down and purify and look for any evidence of exosomes in the supernatant. And it's something that's been really, really difficult to generate compelling evidence that we've got genuine tissue-derived vesicles in the system, especially given the amount of, of debris and um, membrane fragments that's going to be around in the system. So if you're trying to do this with, I guess, frozen tissue sections, you have less tissue material to work with initially, I think it's going to be a real challenge. But crikey, if you, if you do crack that, that would be a very useful, um, very useful innovation, and I'd love to hear how you do it. Okay, next question. Um, have you found it necessary to use microvesicle depleted serum in your cell culture protocols? Yes. Yes, you will. Um, well, I guess depending on what your what your method of purification is, if you um, had some sort of affinity based purification where you could specifically pull out uh, your vesicle of of choice, then I guess it might not be an issue. However, in any of the other methodologies where you're basically uh, separating on the basis of size. The presence of vesicles um, in your serum are going to um, cause some issues with uh, understanding the purity, understanding the count number that you're able to recover. I totally agree with that, uh, Amadeo. Um, we use um, bovine serum that we prepare in our lab. We deplete by spinning mm -hmm. hard overnight. Yep. And this gives us a good elimination. Doesn't doesn't get rid of everything. Um, but it gives us, we think, around 90 to 95% depletion of bovine vesicles in the system. Mm -hmm. I am aware of some commercial products um, which you can buy off the shelf which claim to be, um, you know, vesicle depleted FBS. Um, and I'm also aware of rumors surrounding some of these products where the companies are quite reluctant sometimes to tell you how they do this depletion. One company will use polyethylene glycol and precipitate yeah. the vesicles from the FBS. Now, if that's the case, I'd certainly want to know if there was PEG in the FBS that I was adding to my cells in culture, because it may have a huge um, implication on my downstream analysis of the preps. Um, so, please, if you're buying stuff from from companies which claim to be um, exosome depleted FBS, do engage with them, get a clear answer from them how they're doing the depletion, and understand how that process may impact your downstream analysis of of your work. I think it's really important to know that. Um, just to, to piggyback on that thought, I can uh, attest to uh, Dr. Clayton's um, concerns regarding uh, the use of these um, commercially available exosome-depleted 
serums and their um, sort of incompatibility with certain downstream applications. I've seen this firsthand. So um, if, if this is a, a, a way that you would like to go, um, I would recommend that you um, the first off validate whether this is going to have any impact on your downstream application, whatever it may be, and then perhaps work with the company to understand what is, what is being used for the depletion method. All right. We're actually up to an hour, but there's still a, a good number of great questions here. So if uh, the two presenters are up for another five or maybe ten minutes, um, sure. I'd like to, to yeah, continue with that uh, to fine. cover as many questions as we can. Uh, so next is, uh, do you think that the affinity capture method might change the functions of the exosome? Wow, that's a great question. Um, we know when you isolate certain cell types with antibody-coated beads, for example, you can get cellular activation, and it's very much antibody dependent, um, depending on which receptors are being cross-linked, for example. In terms of exosomes, I don't know. I can't imagine you're going to have a, a kind of receptor signaling change mm -hmm. in the exosome vesicle. However, if you are capping um, proteins on the surface of the exosomes with antibodies, and those antibodies remain as you add them to your functional system, it's bound to have some impact. Um, I think some beads can be very big. So a lot of the immunomagnetic beads that we would use for flow cytometry are pretty enormous and they may essentially squash and damage the vesicles during the wash, um, the magnetic pull down and, and the wash depth. So there's a danger in harming your vesicles then and bursting them open. Again, that would change their function. Um, we did do some experiments back in 2004 when we had exosome-coated beads, and we were adding them to cells and measuring calcium signaling responses in response to exosome cell surface contact, although directing this because the exosomes were immobilized on the surface of bees, which were held by a micro-injection needle onto the surface of the cells. And the cells would signal beautifully in response to this contact. So there's an example where the affinity hasn't really had an impact on the exosome function. So again, it's very difficult to give a general answer for this. It'll depend on what you're pulling them down based on and what you're measuring in response to that. All right, next question. Um, at what safety level do you work with immunogenic particles? Yes, yeah, so I think this question relates to the possibility of um, viruses in vesicle preparations. And certainly, if you have a source of vesicles which contains um, infectious virus, there's every possible chance, if you just do a simple pelleting type of protocol, that you're also concentrating viruses um, with your vesicle. So this is a really important consideration for people working with HIV um, or CMV or other infectious viruses like EBV, for example. There are methods available that may help you sort and separate virion from vesicles. Um, but again, this is a very difficult thing to do well. I mentioned OptiPrep gradients as a strategy for doing so. There may be others. And um, again, this is very difficult to, to do with absolute certainty that you have no virus in your vesicle prep. So, you know, play safe. So if you do have a system involving virus, then I would absolutely do all my work relating to vesicles in a suitable biological safety cabinet and not take any risk with handling the material in assays either. So do all that in the, in the class two safety cabinet show. Okay, next question. Um, are there certain cell lines that are more or less conducive for preparing vesicles? Well, yes, um, this is very true. Um, we know that um, any given cell with ma will make more or make less vesicles than another cell. Um, there are some cell lines which are used commonly, which may also have the viruses. Um, and then you have not just vesicle preps, but you also have this virion shedding, which can be extensive. Um, so you don't want really to be working with a line that has a known virus infection. Um, and the way we know that um, some cells make more than others is really based on nanocyte type of methodology where you're controlling for cell numbers and you're looking at particles in the, in the supernatants. And these can vary hugely from cell type to cell type. 
um, I think the tumour cells because they're cycling they do seem to make an awful lot more vesicles than something like an endothelial cell or a stromal cell or a mesenchymal stem cell which seem to make fewer cells, fewer vesicles so it's more challenging to work with. Okay, this next question is directed to Dr. Capion. It says, have you compared the biological activity of EVs after the Amicon method versus ultracentrifugation? Um, we have not. We have not explored um, looking at um, our preps in sort of any functional assay. Um, all we've done to this point is um, either look at surface, uh, what's on the surface, or what's inside, either looking at um, protein content or RNA content. We have we have done no functional assays. Be, being able to take the uh, an, a, a prep that we made, uh, label it, or do something with it, and then ask, you know, how well does this bind or be taken up by uh, another cell type? No, we haven't done anything along those lines as of yet. Okay, we have time for uh, another maybe couple of questions here. Uh, next one is, what is your starting serum protein concentration and volume for serum exosome preps? Right. Um, we haven't done a lot with serum, to be honest with you. We've, we've done um, some work in the recent past on human plasma from healthy donors and a little bit on plasma from cancer patients' blood. Um, the column method, which I described in the in the slide presentation, we typically start with something like one to one and a half mil of plasma, and that goes straight on the column after pre-clearing, um, of course, to get rid of any debris from the system, such as platelets or what have you. Um, and from that one and a half or so mils, um, we collect fractions which are rich in vesicles, and there's enough material there for us to do the downstream analysis with. Um, it depends really on the on the application. I think if you had an RNA extraction and a PCR based reader, you may well be able to get away with slightly less because of this PCR amplification that you're using to your advantage there. But for protein based studies based on either antibodies or mass spec or what have you, um, we do seem to require at least one mil or so of plasma to get enough vesicles to play with. Okay, uh, next question. Which method do you think is most suitable for large-scale isolation procedures? Yeah, the, what, I, I would ask what, um, what is meant by large-scale? You know, we're talking well, 50 mil? That's not specified in the question, okay. so you'll have to sort of define it yourself, I guess, in your answer. Well, depending on... Um, if you wanted to, if you're real, if you're only needing to enrich, the Amicon Ultra method allows a very rapid way of doing this. Um, being able to use the 15 mil devices, you could prep uh, 15 mils, or in two devices, you could prep 30 mils in yeah, 45 minutes. So that's a fairly rapid way of enriching for um, your EV fraction in a fairly short amount of time, and be able to work in a in um, a slightly larger volume. There are okay. there's a there's quite a lot of interest now from um, both the commercial sector and academic people trying to scale up perhaps maybe um, with a therapeutic um, application in mind. Um, and, uh, with respect to that, you're handling hundreds of millions of cells and, and litres worth of of medium, um, which is really unfeasible if you were using a, a simple filtration or a mm -hmm. centrifugation based system. Yep. So one um, one approach is the larger version of the hollow fiber filtration systems which I mentioned and these can be scaled up to handle tens of litres and in many cases the, the plastic ware and the filters are um, fully GMP compliant. So it's a way of really, really scaling up the handling of um, supernatants from cell cultures and concentrating that liquid down to a level where it then becomes feasible to maybe look at a different filtration or a centrifugation based approach for concentrating and purifying later on. Okay, uh, I think this will be the last question here. It says, how can we purify the exosomes from bacteria which have extra membrane vesicles? Mm 
Well, yeah, I have absolutely no experience at all in handling bugs. It's not a question I, I'm able to comfortably take. Amadeo, any any? I have idea? I have uh, no experience um, with uh, attempting to do anything like that on, in bacteria. So, you know, I I wouldn't know exactly where to start either. <laughs> All right. Well, that sounds like that's a whole different beast. Uh, right there. Unfortunately. Um, however, we are just we are uh, actually over time, not only just out of time, but over time. And so we need to conclude the, the question and answer session. Uh, I'd like to tell you that today's webinar has been recorded and will be available for viewing in the next few days. We will send each of you an, an email with details of how to access the recorded webinar along with a PDF of the slides and instructions on how to personalize and print a certificate of attendance. So on behalf of today's speakers, Dr. Alan Clayton and Dr. Amadeo Capion, and from me, Gwen Taylor, and our sponsor, EMD Millipore, we sincerely appreciate your attending today's webinar and hope you learned some very valuable information. This concludes today's webinar, and we look forward to your attendance at future events from Current Protocols. <laughs>